If you've been invested in manga or anime for any length of time, chances are you've at some point fallen in love with a title from Shonen Jump. The now legendary publication first began in 1968 and since then has consistently published titles both widely popular and critically acclaimed. One such title was 2008's metafictional Bakuman, a series about a young artist-writer duo trying to get their manga published in a fictional version of Shonen Jump, while the actual manga itself was published in Shonen Jump in real life. It gave a fascinating insight into how the legendary publication worked, as each of the characters vied for the number one spot in the Shonen Jump weekly popularity polls, which was a survey sent out to the readers of Jump asking them to rate their favourite titles from best to worst. With popular series regularly receiving anime adaptations, feature films and merchandise, while those that score low quickly disappear from its pages. While Bakuman ended in 2012, the same weekly war still takes place in Shonen Jump today, and after rereading a little Bakuman recently, I've been wondering, what are the popular titles in Jump right now, and how is the magazine itself doing? In other words, what is the current state of Shonen Jump. The best place we can start with this question is with our old friend, the Shonen Jump ranking data. If you'd like to see a full breakdown of how I came to these figures, just go to my Fall of Bleach video. But suffice to say, it's a pretty arduous task involving a lot of numbers and spreadsheets, based off the previously mentioned ranking of the Shonen Jump titles as seen in their index. This graph represents the performance of Shonen Jump's top 10 manga in 2016, and if we average them out over the course of a year, we get a list that looks a little like this. At number 10 we have World Trigger, a sci-fi battle series which I have not yet had a chance to read, but is apparently pretty good, but was also unfortunately the subject of a pretty lacklustre anime adaptation. Number 9 is The Disastrous Life of Saki, a gag manga about a high schooler with psychic powers trying and failing to live a normal life. At number 8 we have Samon Kun Wa Summoner, a gag slash vaguely action oriented series about a high school boy adept at summoning demons and tormenting his friends. In at number 7 we have Food Wars, a rather beautifully illustrated battle slash cooking manga with an extreme penchant for fan service. In at number 6 we have Hane Moro Zumo. I've only had a chance to read the first couple of chapters of this one, but what really stands out is the spectacular artwork, really making the sumo matches feel like intense, desperate struggles. Coming in at number 5 we have The Promised Neverland, which chronicles the lives of a group of young children growing up in an orphanage where things are really bad, there's some bad things going on in that orphanage. I'm currently up to date with this series and I'm kind of in two minds about it. The plot setup is really strong, but the characters feel, well, a little flat, and the art ranges from absolutely stellar to pretty weak and inconsistent, but this is also one of the freshest and newest feeling manga starting mid-2016, and as you can tell by the rank, it's quickly building in popularity. Coming in at number 4 is Jump's premiere Beautiful Boys Doing Things Well manga Volleyball Edition, Haikyuu. Number 3 is a relative newcomer starting in 2015 and it is the story of Black Clover. From what I've read this feels like a totally serviceable battle manga. The main character is fun and the artwork is decent, but it also has the air of a series heavily influenced by its contemporaries, and whether it's going to be able to rise above that and carve out an identity of its own remains to be seen. At number 2 we have Boku no Hero Academia, following the life of Deku, a boy born without superpowers in a world of superheroes, only to have that power mysteriously bestowed on him by his hero All Might. I'm going to leave my personal thoughts on this series for another day, but the artwork is goddamn spectacular, and I think that combined with its clever premise does a lot to account for the monstrous rise of this series. And shockingly, one Piece dominates the number one spot for its 10th year in a row. I've already talked about One Piece a lot in a previous video and I'm planning on doing so again in a future upload, but for now all you really need to know is it's still the reigning king of shonen storytelling. And so, business as usual for weekly shonen jump, right? Well, kind of. The last two odd years have seen some rather unusual occurrences take place within jump. For one, two thirds of the once legendary Big Three are no longer in publication, leaving only One Piece. And that's not the only thing that makes it feel like something is very much afoot in the weekly magazine. 
If we return to our yearly chart, we can see several examples of once popular series that seem to be on the decline, while newer ones seem to be gaining popularity. And not only that, but long-standing titles like Toriko and Gintama didn't even make it into the yearly top 10, holding a rank of 12 and 14 respectively. Even more curious, Toriko actually ended in volume of 51 of Jump, making it one of nine other titles cancelled or concluded in 2016. Which isn't an especially high amount by itself, but what's unusual isn't the amount of manga being cancelled, but the type of manga. Long running series that were once considered a mainstay in the magazine. Toriko, Nisekoi, Bleach, Assassination Classroom, and possibly most notably, this police station in front of Kamari Park in Katsushika Ward, a title that had been running for 40 years. All mainstays at one point in their run, now gone. And so, what's going on at Jump? Well, the problem with using just ranking data to try and answer this question is twofold. For one, we are basically just taking Jump's word on these figures. While we have no real reason to suspect that Shonen Jump would fabricate these numbers, there's also zero transparency to if the actual ranking shown in their index accurately reflects the surveys. And second, they can only really tell us how well a Jump manga is doing within the context of the magazine itself. And so I decided to start doing a little bit of research outside Jump, namely with things like circulation and sales figures. And when I did, things started to become a little clearer. And what it came back to was One Piece. Here are One Piece's sales in 2010, and here they are in 2016. And as you can see, there's a massive decline of 20 million units sold. In fact, in 2014, One Piece dropped to 11.8 million, meaning that Attack on Titan that year came a paltry 150,000 units within outselling One Piece, which would have been the first time a series has done so in seven years. On top of this, if we compare the top 10 manga sales of 2010 to 2016 respectively, we can see a drop in around 20 million units sold, which can be entirely accounted for in the drop in One Piece's sales alone. Which means, manga in general are selling as much as they ever have, but One Piece is in decline. And if One Piece is in decline, so too is Shonen Jump. And backing this up is the fact that Shonen Jump's circulation has dropped from 2.9 million units in 2010 to 2.1 in 2016. And if these trends were to continue, Shonen Jump could risk losing its place atop the world of manga. And this is the reason why they've been so decisive in cancelling and concluding so many old series. Shonen Jump doesn't need old series to perform well, it needs new ones to perform exceptionally. Which is why in the first quarter of 2017, Jump started six brand new series. That's double the amount for the same period in 2015, and triple for that period in 2016. And so, to round out our assessment of Weekly Shonen Jump, let's take a brief look at these six new titles. The first of these new series is Dr. Stone. The world suffers a bizarre catastrophe in which the Earth's population is turned to stone. Our protagonist Taiju awakens thousands of years in the future alone, except for his genius scientist friend Senku. Together, the two find a very limited way to unpetrify people, and must carefully choose who to bring back in order to help them restart human civilization which goes well until they restore what is essentially a cross between Jesus Christ and Hannibal Lecter. It's got quite a distinctive, well-drawn art style, which I think takes a little getting used to, but once you do, it really infuses the series with a bold energy. The good, strong, well-executed premise with unique artwork and a great villain. The bad, characters feel a little flat. Hungry Mary. A gender-swapping romance action series in which a high school student is... Possessed by the former Queen of France, Mary Theresa Charlotte, and body swapping ensues. It's a little more complicated than that, but honestly, I find it hard to talk about much of anything given the extremely poor construction of this manga. If you want to see a near perfect example of how not to lay out a page, this is it. Reading it is a messy, frustrating chore, and not helping matters is an uninspired premise, some weak character writing, and some really lackluster art. Positive, if you squint, it kind of looks like a martial arts yuri. Negative, terrible page layout and Ranma already exists. 
Robot X Laser Beam. Golf is really lame. Everyone knows it, we can all accept it, it's fine. But it's also the subject of the misleadingly titled Robot X Laser Beam. A story about a high schooler nicknamed Robot with the uncanny talent to hit balls with the precision of a laser. I say this without a hint of mockery or ridicule, but our protagonist here is heavily implied to have either autism or Asperger's syndrome, and this really works to the series' advantage, as his extreme natural talent to golf is only surpassed with his complete indifference to it and the world around him, making for some really humorous, endearing character writing. And it's a lot of fun watching robots slowly warm to the game. It's well drawn, it's well laid out, and it actually kind of made me give a shit about golf, and that fact alone means it deserves a lot of credit. The upside, unique, likeable main character, well put together, manages to make golf seem interesting. The downside, golf, U19. After reading the first three chapters, it's difficult to even really get into what exactly U19 is about. Set in the fictional future of 2036 where adults rule the world, it's a dystopian love story where people are genetically tested to determine their lot in life and when our main character Kudo's girlfriend is deemed a triple S rank, she's taken away which causes him to develop a different set of genetics which lead to him having a sewing related superpowers and becoming entangled with a group of teenage terrorists who want to kidnap the Japanese Prime Minister. <sighs> Nothing about U19 is aggressively bad, but it just doesn't really come together in a way that feels coherent, and this inherent lack of focus can be seen in everything from the difficult to understand premise to the busy, cluttered page layouts. Not terrible by any means, but pretty difficult to recommend. Plus, some of the romances conveyed pretty okay, and there's some touching moments in there. Minus, cluttered, unfocused feel, lackluster character designs. We can't study. Ogata is a genius at mathematics, and Furuhashi is a genius at literature. The only problem is that they both want to attend college in the areas that the other one is good at. And so it's down to main character Yuga to tutor them both in their weaknesses to help them get into the colleges of their choice. Despite how contrived the premise may seem, I actually found myself really enjoying this one. The first couple of chapters do a great job of establishing the three main characters and the artwork has a consistently beautiful, polished feel to it, and this helps push it beyond the bounds of your average high school romance. Strengths! Beautiful artwork, endearing characters. Weakness! A hair's breadth from becoming a very typical harem affair. Demon Prince Doros Diaries at the time of writing, there was only one chapter of Demon Prince available, so it's still early days, but my initial impression is that it's pretty okay. Telling the story of the titular young Demon Prince, who wishes to escape the barbaric ways of his violent demon homeworld and pursue the life of a regular high schooler. There's a nice varied quality to the artwork, and overall the first chapter was a pleasant read. But honestly, there just isn't enough of it out to form a solid opinion, but that said, I think you could definitely do worse, and I'm interested to see where it goes. Heaven! Some solid gags, nice range of art styles, simple, well-executed premise. Hell! So far, it feels maybe a little standard. And so, with all this in mind, what is the current state of Shonen Jump? Well, despite some of the issues we've talked about, it's hard not to see Jump's position as anything but positive. While circulation and sales of its primary product are down, the fact is that they're still light years ahead of its competitors. And, with fresh new titles like My Hero Academia quickly becoming sales juggernauts, it's difficult to really paint the company in a negative light. While I think it's always sad to see classic series disappear from its pages, I also have to respect the drive to invest in new series. Titles like The Promised Neverland and Dr. Stone feel fresh in a way that Jump titles haven't for years, and I'll be very curious to see how both series do in the coming months. Whether this new approach will actually pay off or not remains to be seen, but I think, suffice to say, the next year in Jump is going to be an interesting one. Friends, thank you for joining me today. I want to apologise if the sound for this episode is a little rough. I'm working off a new machine and there's been some teething problems with the audio, but it's all sorted now and won't be an issue for future uploads. I want to give a special thank you to everyone who's been supporting me on Patreon. You guys are the absolute best and the entire reason I can do this. If you too would like to help support the channel, then consider heading over to patreon.com slash super eyepatchwolf. I'll be back soon with another video, but in the meantime, why not come hang out at the Let's Fight a Boss video game podcast. We're going to be talking about Hunter x Hunter, Nier, and many, many other things. 
or you can come track me down on Twitter at iPatchWolf. Friends, take care of yourselves, and I'll see you next time.